Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Our first story on how to get your neighbor not to cross your yard. Not the cleanest way, honestly. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. And our first story. He wanted to cut through our yard, so I made him walk through some mud. I lived on the end unit of a townhouse complex. When we first moved in, the back fence was gone. The super told us that it had blown down in a windstorm, and they were going to replace it as soon as they can. Since this was an end unit, there was a little extra piece of grass on the side, which we had to pay extra money a month for. It had a little fence with a gate that opened to the driveway. I noticed the gate was constantly left open. I assumed that the original lock was weak and not closing properly or something, so I replaced it. Didn't help. So I put a padlock on it. I came home from work that day to find the whole lock broken off. It looked like the fence had been kicked in. I didn't see anything stolen from the yard. Not that they would have to kick the fence in to do so. So I asked my next door neighbor if they'd seen anything. They said they'd seen my neighbors behind us cutting through our yard. He'd been complaining before about walking the 50 feet or so to go around the houses. And I guess the storm knocking the fence over was the perfect opportunity for him. I'd never met this neighbor before. So I decided to go with a more passive route. I bought some orange snow fence and a few no trespassing signs, but those were about as useless as spitting at a fire. They were torn down in a few days. I was out washing my car one day when I finally ran into my neighbor cutting through my yard. I tried to be polite. Me. Hey, you're not really supposed to be cutting through my yard. Him. That's not your yard. That's common property. Me. Uh, okay. I understand the confusion. We pay extra on the end unit for the little patch on the side. Him. No, we all get to the edge of our house. Anything else is just a common area. I'm allowed to be here. Me. Look, I don't want to have to call the cops or something. Just please stay off of our property and stop damaging my gate. He didn't say anything more, just continued on his way. But that's when I started noticing garbage appearing all over my yard. Cigarette butts and empty cigarette packs, beer bottles, and stuff that my wife nor I ever really used. So we knew it had to be him throwing stuff into our yard. I would be standing at my back door and he wouldn't even try to hide when he was cutting through anymore. He'd be just looking up at me the whole time. I knew until the new fence went up, there was nothing I could really do. So cue the petty revenge. I had two guinea pigs and I would have to clean out their cage once a week or so. I used to scoop the poop slash hay into the garbage, but I knew a better place to put it. For the next few months, yeah, it took a while to get a new fence. I took the poop and I dumped it right in front of the gate. One nice thing about guinea pig poop is it looks just like mud, so he had no idea it was there. For months, he trudged through poop every time he cut through my yard. I heard him complain about the mud once as he'd just gotten new shoes. They finally got us the new fence. I saw the neighbor walking around one day and he gave me a dirty look like I'd done something wrong. We still get the odd garbage thrown over the fence, but nothing worse than that. My wife and I turned the little side yard into a garden. Always seemed to be nicely fertilized for some reason. And our second story. Don't touch the emails. Well, okay then. Have fun finding a new job. So at my job, I'm one of the supervisors. It's a firm with a lot of employees all tucked into one big room and there are two supervisors and a shift leader in each shift, morning, afternoon, night. These shifts get rotated on occasion, but we supervisors mostly rotate with them. Normally with my typical co-supervisor, we share the responsibility of dealing with all the work-related emails. There's a lot more than one would expect, so it does sometimes take up to even a few hours of each day. One week, one of the shift leaders derped me and put me together with a different supervisor, and we were basically stuck for that month. Now she's absolutely lazy, like ridiculously so, won't even get off her butt during lunch and go eat at the cafeteria. Instead, she makes a mess at her work desk, which would later be used by the supervisor of the next shift. I used to be the schmuck getting the desk from her, and it was always a crummy mess. Because of this, she does none of the actual supervising and never has. During our third day that week, she asked me why I was sitting at the desk for so long and if I had any intention of actually doing my job. I replied that I was doing the emails and she just got super PO'd telling me that was her assigned duty, 
this is how she and her usual supervisor split their load, and told me to get out of the office and go watch the workers. She pretty much screamed it, turning red in the face and all, throwing all sorts of insults at me about my generation never doing crap. So I told her, fine, I'm never touching the emails again. We even signed unofficial workplace contracts distributing our duties evenly, and she got the emails. Now, though we are technically all the same, I am the supervisor most likely to be promoted, so the shift leaders and the director generally talk to me and have me relay some info to the others. So I'm a lot closer to all of them than the other soups are. Well, because of this, I was the first to learn that we'd need to master Excel and hop to it immediately. It wasn't officially announced, but when it was, the lazy bum I was stuck with first refused to learn it, saying it wasn't a skill listed as needed while we applied. Knowledge about Microsoft programs was listed. She kept postponing learning it until we officially got some work to do with Excel. I started doing it right away, and because this isn't something you can just do for another person, each individual soup gets credit based on how many tablets needed we make. They're for some sort of pamphlet, but I have no clue how to describe the full thing in English. So during our third week together, I do the usual routine of checking on the workers, then working with Excel until I meet my quota. Well, because Miss Lazy Bum never used Excel, she got an official warning for not meeting the quota and ended up only barely learning some stuff about Excel. She was still super slow and couldn't even meet the quota, let alone make up for the lost time. Now, during this, the emails, as you may have guessed, remained untouched because Excel took her the full eight hours. During our last week together, the director came in and asked us what was going on and why our shift was always getting clogged with emails. Miss Lazy Bum immediately tried to pin the blame on me, but bippity boppity boo, I had the contract she insisted on us signing. Since she'd already been given a warning for not learning Excel and had a previous complaint about the way she spoke to some of the other employees, she was fired. And our last story. All circuits are down. Back in the 80s, I worked for a custom printed circuit board shop that specialized in 24 or 48 hour deadlines to ship if you paid heavily for it. Boards with circuits on both sides were the cheapest and easiest way to get done on time. We made boards up to 17 layers and each layer you added increased the chances of something going wrong with the board. The boards would shrink slightly, drilling holes would be misaligned, circuit traces would have flaws on them, solder points wouldn't print in the exact spot needed, and other issues. I worked at the first stage of manufacturing, just after the engineers who got the artwork for the job and decided on the materials to be used and the specs of the board. I would drill the holes in a test panel, then have an inspector examine the holes to make sure they were all drilled in the right place and with the right size drill bit. On a multi-layer board, this could take a couple hours to get right then we'd send the job to be manufactured. Frequently, we'd have jobs sent back for defects. We'd adjust the artwork or where the holes drilled to correct for the material shrinking or warping and send the job through again. The most expensive job I worked on was for about $850,000 for a 17 layer board. They wanted two. All the circuits were gold plated and they needed it in two days. After I'd been there five months, I wrote a program in Quick Basic on my own time that would take our reject rate at first certification from 80% down to 5% after inputting the dimensions and specs of the board. This saved us from two to eight hours per job. After tweaking it for a couple more months, I reduced the reject rate from warping down from 45% to 3% on most jobs. This made a huge impact on the company in terms of delivery and profit. When my boss told the head of IT what I'd written, he asked to get a copy and see how well it worked. What I didn't know was that he would use a hex code editor on my compiled program to change my name to display his when the program started. He went to the company's owner and showed off what he wrote and got a huge raise, a very generous bonus and promotion. I got quietly told to shut up, I'd be rewarded too. My reward wasn't more money, it was that I got to come in and leave an hour early on second shift. Since it was my word against his and my boss didn't have the clout to back me up, I left the company. Now on to the revenge. I wrote the program so that every year on the page where it would ask for the job ID number, a message would appear at the bottom stating, we request that you wish the author of this program a most happy birthday. If they typed in happy birthday, the program would continue for another year. 
If they didn't, it would remove my name from a text file on the company's share listing everyone's birthday. The program would check for my name every time it ran, and if it went missing, it would report an error message I made up that sounded bad. Binary coding stack overflow error, input invalid. The day after my birthday, my old boss called me to see if I had a copy still because his stopped working. The entire system was shut down while people tried to remember how to set up a job manually. All contracts they had for quick turnaround were late that month, and the sales department had to stop taking new quick orders. The owner demanded the head of IT fix it and get them back up and running. He finally had to admit that he didn't write it and had no idea how to program. He was fired on the spot. They lost so much money in the next couple of months that the owner had to sell the company. Most of the employees transitioned to the new company with a little lower pay, but with less stress and better benefits. The former head of IT ended up starting his own company, tutoring math to grade schoolers. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.